Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now, Caesar was a title used for a Roman emperor, much like we use the term president today as a title. This Caesar was called Augustus, but his actual name was, does anybody know his actual name? Gaius Octavius. Ooh. He succeeded Julius Caesar in 27 BC and reigned until AD 14, and his successor was, anybody know his successor? Tiberius Caesar. His steps up. Yeah. And verse 2. And this taxing was first made in Cyrenius, was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one unto his own city. And his own town refers not to where Joseph presently lived, which was Nazareth, but to the town of his ancestral roots, which was Bethlehem which was also called the city of David because guess what? Any kids know what was called the, uh, the city of David? It's because King David grew up there. And Joseph was a descendant from David. So the trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem, listen, would have taken how many days? How many you think? Three days, and it covered roughly how many miles, you think? 90 miles. Yeah. And Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. And it was a significant undertaking, listen, costing time, and costing money due to the this is interesting due to the height of Bethlehem which was 2,564 feet above sea levels travelers would go up from Nazareth which was 1,830 feet above sea level to Bethlehem even though proceeding south so it was kind of like what your dad you maybe your grandpa said I had to walk in the snow uphill both ways <laughs> to go to school Literally, they had to go uphill all the way. And another note, too, anytime anybody ever goes to Jerusalem, they always go up to Jerusalem. God looks at Jerusalem as the pinnacle of the earth. I don't care what direction you're coming from. If you're going to Jerusalem, you're going up to Jerusalem. That's a side note. Verse 5, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. In other words, she had a baby. What baby did Mary have? Baby what? Baby. baby. Jesus, we have a winner. Chicken dinner. <laughs> Joseph paid his taxes. And that's proper to do as of Romans 13, 8 says. Joseph and Mary, listen, were not impoverished. I don't care what you see in these movies. They were not impoverished. They were not in poverty. They had enough money that they could not only pay their taxes, but they had enough money to travel with. And they had enough money that if there was a hotel open, they could have stayed there. They had money. Because Joseph was a hard worker. He was a carpenter. And verse 6 says, And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. At the average pace of 20 miles per day, this would have taken four and a half days with Mary in her, con with, in her condition. It could have easily been even maybe a week or more because she was very far along in her pregnancy, so they might have had to take more potty breaks. So with Mary in her condition, it could have easily been a week or more. We often think that, listen, Mary was close to delivery when they made this journey, but this may not have been the case at all, maybe. Joseph may have been, listen, anxious to get her out of Nazareth to avoid the pressure of scandal. And I'm going to let you parents talk to the kids about that. 
According to the Roman law, Mary didn't have to go with Joseph for the tax census. She didn't have to. But it made sense for her to go with Joseph, especially because she was in the latter stages of the controversial pregnancy. Surely the subject of much gossip in Nazareth. I'm sure it was the talk of the town. It's possible that he used the emperor's orders as a means of removing Mary from the possible gossip and emotional stress in her own village. So he loved her so much he didn't want her to have to go through all that. So it's like, come on, girl. i got to do this, so come on with me. Let's go. Trying to protect her. In verse 7, and she brought forth, and she brought forth, and she brought forth her firstborn son. Not her only son, but her firstborn son. And wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. We are not told that anyone assisted Mary in the birth. She brought forth. All right, go ahead and get them, get them gears turning for all the theologians in the room. We just went real deep, real quick. This young woman was completely separated from all her family and all her supporting friends. Her and God, right there. The word translated swaddling clothes, we hear that a lot, comes from the ancient Greek word meaning, listen, to tear. Meaning they were torn strips of cloth wrapped around Jesus. He didn't even get a full, com he didn't even get a complete used garment from the thrift store. He had to have strips of cloth. And he was laid in a manger. Y'all know what a manger is? It's a feeding trough for animals. I mean, it's not this little place that they make for little babies. It's made to put food in for animals to eat from. That's where Jesus was laid. In verse number 8, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. Interesting also, Bethlehem shepherds were known to care, listen, for the temple flock. So these could have been temple shepherds who were keeping the sheep to be used as the sin sacrifice. Therefore, it would be appropriate for them to come inspect the Lamb of God. Yeah. We went deep again. And they would inspect the Lamb of God to verify that he was without blemish. Verse 9. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Verse 10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And this is a direct reference to Jesus being not only the Jewish Messiah, but also the Savior of the world. It is only natural to be terrified at the sight of an angel, not to mention a sudden overwhelming light from the sky. And the good tidings concern a person, not some religion. Say that again. The good tidings concern people not some religion with its creeds, doctrines, confessions, and outward forms. And verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ. Christ means what, faith school? The anointing, and his, the anointed one and his anointing. Christ the Lord. Jesus was Lord at his birth. From the time he popped out of the womb, he was Lord. Although his physical body was small and totally dependent on others. His physical body grew and had, he had to learn. Listen, Jesus had to learn to talk. He had to learn to walk. He had to learn to eat. He had to learn to put his own sandal on. He had to learn how to tie things. He had to learn all that stuff. But in the spirit, he was God at birth. 
verse 12. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in the swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And I'm sure this was a puzzle to the shepherds. Yet no earthly accommodations could have been adequate anyway. I, mean, I think we talked about that, that that manger wasn't like disinfected, sanitized. They didn't lie solid. Same thing that they didn't, you know, pour a little bit of bleach in with those little swaddling strips to wash and dry. And Think what kind of environment she had to give birth in. And that baby being brought into the most humble place. Say that again, Pastor Kimberly. Do you have a mic? Just like he comes into our mess. That's right. You know, he, he comes and lays right in the middle of our mess when he saves us. It's kind of what he did when he came into the mess of the manger. Yep. He knows about messes, doesn't he? Jesus humbled himself to become a man in verse 13. And suddenly, look at your neighbor and say, suddenly. There was with the angel a multitude. How much is a multitude? A lot. A multitude of heavenly hosts. That word host means army. A heavenly army. The angels are the heavenly army. The heavenly host. But you know what they were doing? They were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. The praise of the heavenly host is well known today. Have you heard a song on the radio that goes, uh, Gloria in excelsis Deo. Remember that song? Yes. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Listen, comes from the first words of this verse. In Latin, it means glory to God in the highest. So when you hear them saying in excelsis Deo, that's what they're saying. Glory to God in the highest. You learned some Latin today. I know you've always wanted to know. And we have Gloria with us today. She might be off camera, but she's with us today. So the peace that the heavenly host was singing about was not peace among mankind. How many times did you know that there's still people that get mad at each other? Families that get mad at each other. Football teams that get mad at each other. <laughs> Countries that get mad at each other. So it wasn't peace among mankind but a peace between God and mankind. God said, I'm not mad no more. The price is going to be paid. So they were rejoicing that the war between God and man was over. Verse 15, And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which was come to pass, which the Lord hath made unto us. Aren't you glad those shepherds aren't like most church folk today? Well, you know that looks fancy, but it's a long way to go. We're all comfortable out here. It's starting to rain. We've got to stay out here. Maybe we'll do it tomorrow. Maybe we'll do it next week. So many things to do, places to go, people to see, responsibilities to take care of. But no, it says that they immediately, they said, let us go now. Look at your neighbor and say, now. They didn't hesitate at all. And guess what? God's looking for his children to be obedient, that when he speaks to them, that they will not hesitate at all. These shepherds demonstrated faith in the revelation they have received. That's why they did it immediately. They're like, this is real. This is God. And I, we trust it. And let's go now to see what is this thing is. This thing is literally translated. Here we go. For all of our Bible study, study, Bible study students that appreciate this. When the shepherds say, and 
and see this thing which has come to pass. Listen, this thing is literally translated this word. Not any word from our faith school class. When they said, let's see this thing, they're saying, and let's see this rhema. That word rhema is right there. Well, that puts a whole new depth to it, doesn't it? Because faith comes by what? Ah. Oh. A word is uttered by a living voice. That's what rhema is. And they heard the utterance of the living voice. They heard a rhema, and faith came. And they acted on that faith because they immediately went to see. Verse 16. And they came with haste. They wasn't just strolling and, you know, swagging their way over. <laughs> they girded up their loins and they started walking quickly. They made haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. It's a lovely thought that these shepherds who looked after the temple lambs were the first to see the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And verse 17, And when they had seen it, they made known... They made known, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. When we see the Lord for who he is, we will make known to everyone who will listen. A lot of people ain't seen a lot, saying a lot to a lot of people about the Lord because they really haven't seen him for who he is. He's just a historical figure or a character or here in the, or here in the Bible, bait, Bible belt. Everybody just grows up hearing about a Jesus. But when they see him for who he is, they'll make it known to everyone who will listen. These guys were the first evangelists. I know a lot of people say that the lady in the well was the first evangelist or that, you know, with the after the risen Savior that, Mary Magdalene then was the first evangelist, but really, these guys were. Really the first, yeah, yeah. Of, of, of when he was actually born up upon the earth. I guess if you really want to get technical, if you want to be a technical Timmy, you, could go, you can go back to prophecies that prophesied his birth hundreds of years ago. But when he was born, these guys were the first to go out and tell people about Jesus. These shepherds, having charge of flocks devoted to sacrifice in the temple, would meet those who came to worship and to sacrifice. What a great place. In other words, they were in the prime area. They were going to have lots of travelers coming and going. God knows what he's doing. And so they went to do that to proclaim the Messiah in the temple. Verse 18, and they all heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So there must have been hundreds or maybe even possibly thousands of people who heard this message. Yet it would be 30 years before Jesus was revealed to the world. So imagine how they felt. They saw the angels. They heard the angels. They had a rhema word. They acted upon the rhema word. They proclaimed the rhema word. And it wasn't, and then it took 30 years before people were like, oh, we thought you were crazy. But we know now, this guy walking around making the lame to leap and the blind to see, yeah, okay. 30 years to manifest what they were saying. Verse 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. See, Mary's reaction was different than either the shepherds or those who heard them. She calmly took it all in and meditated it over and over in her heart, seeking to understand the deep meaning of it all. God didn't give her everything. He just said, would you be willing to be the one? She said, I am your handmaid, it be in, unto you. But she didn't have it all figured out. That song, Mary, did you know, and that line where it says you, when you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. For some reason, that really struck me this year with that song. Is just, 
I don't know if it's because I have a new green baby and you're used to smothering your babies with kisses and just, you know, but imagine you're doing that with Jesus. God, that you, I mean, when you really, I don't know, the gravity of it just really hit me this season that yeah. you're kissing the face of God. That little baby, like, I mean, just think how you are with little babies. You just want to snuggle and kiss them and smother them. And you're d Mary's doing that with Jesus, with the with God. That's just, wow. Yeah, she was trying to, she meditated just like we're supposed to, to get deeper revelation. She knew that he was the promised Messiah. Listen, but she didn't know that he was going to come back with fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. She probably didn't see him walking on water just to show everybody that this world and its problems are all under my feet. And that the, even the dead, even death didn't have authority over him. So she was pondering them in her heart. What in the world is this? So Mary was combining all the things that she had heard from Gabriel, Elizabeth, and the shepherds with the, with the prophecies of Scripture. She was making a casserole in her heart, putting all that in there and stirring it up. And this is how we get revelation from Holy Spirit, the same way. Verse 20. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, and it was told unto them. They knew that they had received a special message and had been privileged. Listen, privileged. We take for granted sometimes when we get a revelation from God. Like I know I, I feed good. My pastor feeds me good. And sometimes I just have to step back and say, thank you, Lord. I don't want to get so used to revelations that it becomes common. They knew they had received a special message and had been privileged. Think that. Privileged. Because remember, God in his mercy, listen, he doesn't hide things from us. He hides it for us. He doesn't reveal it to us before we're ready to handle it. Because if that was the case, then he would have to hold us accountable to something that we wasn't ready for. Then that, that's not right. So when he reveals something to us, listen, we're privileged. Amen. God's saying, you can handle this now. Amen. I can hold you accountable to this now, and I know you're going to be okay with it. So listen, so once again... Uh, you know, don't judge your neighbor beside of you that you're walking out of a message. You got three things that are changing the direction of your life. They're sitting there and all they say is, well, that was okay. Listen, they might not be mature enough to handle that revelation because if God revealed it to, pulled the back and gave them that true revelation, and I'm not talking about just connecting dots in your head. I'm talking about true heart revelations and revealed it to them and God knew that they were going to say no, then God would have to hold them accountable and have to judge them on that. So in his mercy, he holds it back from them. So when you get a revelation, feel privileged. So these shepherds, and I'm just about done, these shepherds valued what they had seen and heard. That's probably one of the reasons why they were given that. They, were, they valued it. Because we heard stories that we even learned last week. There's a lot of people that were like, oh, a supper? Oh, I ain't coming. I got this to do. I got that to do. That. But they were in haste to go see. Glorifying God is one of the keys to staying full of God and keeping alive the memory of all he has done and shown to us. So listen to this, kids. Listen, you can't be thankful for what you don't remember. Let me say that slowly. You can't be thankful for what you don't remember. So I'm going to go around here on the floor as we end. And I'm going to ask you, what are you thankful for? Pastor Campbell, you want to pass the mic around? And we'll hold the mic so it doesn't get tossed. What are you thankful for? Uh, I'm thankful for... Uh, so, uh, so, so, is there something that I'm thankful for? 
Okay. Yeah. My sister's sacred for Sabbath too. Okay. All right. Gigi, what are you thankful for? Uh, I want Gracie Gihitelli. <laughs> what are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? Are you glad you have your mommy? Yeah. Yeah, you glad you have your mommy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you thankful for? Yeah. You're thankful for your mom? Okay. Paisley, what are you thankful for? You want to come up here? And your grandpa. His, his mom and his grandpa. What are you thankful for, Paisley? I'm thankful for my beads. Your beads? I got them for my birthday. Oh, she got them for her birthday. Okay. I like beads, too. What are you thankful for, Cole? Here he comes. What are you thankful for? I'm thankful uh, I'd have a Christmas. For Christmas? <laughs> Taylor, what are you thankful for? Taylor's thankful for waking up. <laughs> Amen. You think Tyler's still asleep? Are you thankful so. for an iPad for Christmas? Is that what you said? <laughs> okay. Well, you know what it's time for now? Presents. Yeah! <laughs> but first. But first. Taylor? As everybody knows, tomorrow is whose birthday tomorrow? Jesus. It's Jesus' birthday. But does anybody know what today is? Pastor it's Pastor Bobby's Ooh. birthday. So Taylor, because y'all don't want me to do it, Taylor is going to start uh, the happy birthday song for Pastor Bobby. Yeah. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to Esther Bobby, happy birthday to you. I'm going to get the presents. And we're going to bring them back here, and I want everybody to come enjoy some blueberry yum-yum on our way out. That's Pastor Bobby's favorite dessert. And, huh? <laughs> and everybody, look at what time it is. It's 11.04. You'll never see a service An like this four minutes. <laughs> until it rotates around that Christmas is on a Sunday again. So enjoy. Well, let me pray. Let me pray real quick. Father, we just thank you for this time. Thank you for your son, Jesus, that we celebrate at this time. Lord, we do celebrate Pastor Bobby, but we do know that it is the reason for this season right now, Lord, is Jesus. And we just thank you that he came humbly to the earth as a baby so that he could learn and grow and experience things that we experience so that he knows what we're going through. But, Father, we thank you even more that he conquered death, hell, and the grave, and that he rose again, and he's coming back one day. And even though we celebrate the baby tomorrow, we celebrate the king of kings who is coming back to reign and rule on this earth. And we just thank you for the power and the authority that you have given to us in the meantime. May we walk in love this season. It's a hard season for people who have lost loved ones, difficult situations with family, being alone, Whatever that is, they are never alone. Just as Pastor Bobby was saying, Mary was alone with Jesus, and that was all she needed. And that's all we need is Jesus. So may everybody experience your presence this Christmas in Jesus' name. <laughs>